Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started. We've got a very exciting Renal Grand Rounds today um, with a distinguished visitor. And um, Dr. Uh, David, who's the Krumlovsky Endowed Chair in Nephrology, is going to do the introductions. I just wanted to make two quick announcements. Next week's Renal Grand Rounds will be replaced by uh, a bit of a different event. We're going to have lunch and we're going to do the Neph Madness. And I'm going to be recruiting some uh, keen faculty members to do the uh, presentations this year. Um, and then we're going to let the fellows and the faculty each put in their own brackets. But um, a, fun, a fun event next week. And then for those of you who are interested in running, uh, and you don't know yet that our awesome fellow, uh, Lonnie Thatch, has put together a team, You're in Trouble, for the Shamrock Shuffle, which is a week this Sunday. There's still time to sign up. Uh, there's some awesome shirts um, coming as well, and it's only five miles and uh, no time requirement. So walk, run, jog. I'm looking at you, Maggie. I think you need to be in that that team. Um, okay, so with no further ado, I'm going to uh, ask Dr. David to uh, come to the podium. But <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Sue. So um, we have a special guy with us today, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Tom Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas is a professor of medicine and a member of the Division of Nephrology at uh, Columbia University Medical Center. He completed his internal medicine residency at UPenn and his nephrology fellowship at Columbia University. So as I said, Tom is quite special because he is one of the rare, uh, well, I should say extremely rare, talented nephrologists nowadays with a primary interest uh, in bone and mineral metabolism. And his main focus uh, is the study of renal osteodystrophy, which is the bone disease affecting patients with chronic kidney disease. His lab is one of the few to use high-resolution bone imaging in patients uh, to identify how kidney disease impacts bone. And overall, his major goal uh, is to develop novel and effective strategies uh, that will preserve skeletal integrity and prevent bone disease uh, and fractures in patients with kidney disease. So as a most recent example um, um, of his extraordinary work, his group uh, identified over circulating markers of bone turnover based on microRNA screenings for the non-invasive diagnosis of renal osteodystrophy type. Um, Tom is one of the most accomplished scientists and clinicians I know. He is an editor in almost all of the leading journals in the field. He's also a member of the KDGO Bone Quality Working Group and has made a lot of contributions to our understanding of renal osteodystrophy. Um, he has published, let me count them, over 90 articles in prestigious journals such as Nature, KI, a Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, and JSN. He has over 30 reviews and book chapters and has received numerous awards for his original work. Uh, and if this is not sufficient, uh, Tom is also heavily funded with five NIH awards as a PI and uh, several as co-investigator. So I can stand here the whole day and tell you about how great Tom is, but I think he's going to talk to us about the ma uh, management of osteoporosis in patients with CKD, and I should let him come to the mic. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, thanks Bell. I also have a lot of imposteritis, so <laughs> that's a lot to, to swallow. Uh, so anyway, thanks for having me. It's great, it's great to be here. So I was just commenting that it's, it's wonderful to be in person. And we at Columbia have not even gone to a renal rounds in person yet. So it's wonderful to be here and then to network with everybody. And I'm, I'm going to talk today about management of osteoporosis in patients with CKD. Um, I think as most people are aware, 
Okay. Right. Is, that, is that a little better or, or not? Because I can, I can ditch this and go to that if I need to. Okay, great. Is that better? Great, okay. So I think as most of you guys know, I, I, I work sort of in this nephrochronology field and I do a lot of overlap of metabolic complications in patients with kidney d disease, focusing mostly on the skeleton and hyperparathyroid disorders. And over the past number of, of years, I, I've noticed that we have this tremendous overlap between these two disorders of aging, between CKD and osteoporosis, but we really don't know how to manage it. And there's a lot of controversy behind this. And I want to give today a, a, a presentation about what this controversy is, what, what the problems are, and then how we can try and operationalize, g given the current state of our data, uh, which unfortunately is poor, strategies to try and handle the bone uh, problem that presents in our patients. So I know for a grand rounds, we usually do a case presentation with one case, but I want to just give you three here as an example of the real heterogeneity of the disease that presents. So here are three patients, all with the same femoral neck T-score. They all have the same GFR, but when you, but when you evaluate what the cause of the kid and, the, and the duration of kidney failure is, there, there's, a, there's a lot of variety here. So you have one patient who had an AKI event six months prior, didn't really resolve well, um, has no real past medical history and takes one drug for hypertension. You have the second patient with a long-standing history of hypertensive CKD um, on multiple drugs for hypertension and then some, some drugs to handle the, the mineral component of, of CKD and BD. And then you have another more complex patient with a very long history of CKD, dialysis, transplantation, with an autoimmune disorder that's highly inflammatory and also affects the skeleton, and then takes multiple medications that also impair skeletal integrity, such as steroids, and then other medications to treat MBD, including uh, calcium, D3, and sinicalcet. We'll, we'll come back to this case in, 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 in a moment to talk about strategies. So, MBD, or mineral and bone disease, and CKD is a, tri a triad um, that affects the, the complete body, so it's a systemic disorder that manifests itself in terms of laboratory abnormalities, bone abnormalities, and then vascular calcifications. And then the clinical outcomes that, that occur with this disorder include cardiovascular risk, fractures, and mortality. I'm going to focus only on the bone component and, and on fracture risk. So why, why, why do we worry about bone and CKD patients, and why should this be on our radar? So let's, let's first start out with the incidence of, of hip fractures that occur in our patients compared to that of the general population. So the, these data come from CMS, also from Canadian data sets, and they're, so it, it's a composite of, of data. Um, you see in the black line um, across age groups the, the hip fracture incidence rates uh, for the general kidney healthy population. And then you contrast that with what we see in our CKD patients. So we see increased rates of fractures at all age groups, um, in particular in our older patients, and then that, that risk of fracture increases with CKD severity, being worst, of course, in our dialysis patients. And some epi data suggests that fracture rates are up to 17-fold higher in older dialysis patients than our kidney healthy, than our kidney healthy patients. When we, when we also look at fracture rates over time in the general population and compare it to patients with dialysis uh, dependent CKD, we also see some troubling, some troubling trends. So, so these data here come from CMS data in the healthy population. Um, and what we see here is that, sorry. Okay. So what we, what we see is that over a 30-year time period, with the introduction of bisphosphonates, we've seen a significant reduction in hip fracture rates in the general population. When we superimpose on that data from that same time period for dialysis patients, and we break the fracture rates down, or the fracture sites down to peripheral fractures, so this would be on, let's say, arm and leg and, and, and hip fractures, we see that in that same time period, we have increases in fracture rates that, that occur at, at both the central and peripheral skeleton. And then we see that there's been a doubling of fracture rates at the peripheral skeleton, 
And then in 2004, with the introduction of calcimimetics uh, into the dialysis cohorts, we've seen that despite treatment for better PTH suppression, which we've, al which we've always thought of as the big driving force behind fractures in CAD patients, that these rates have continued to increase. So the, the, these data suggest to us that, that we're doing something wrong. And then when we think about what happens after fracture, so yes, fracture is painful, it results in morbidity, patients, are maybe they're wheelchair bound, maybe they never return to their previous level of function. We have to also superimpose on that what else happens. So after hip fractures, mortality rates increase. And we see that when we compare non-dialysis and ESKD patients to the general population, that there's a graded increase in mortality, almost a threefold increase as you progress to, to dialysis. We also see that there are increased costs associated with fractures that, that increase with uh, severity of CKD. And when we, when we add up those costs over the whole entire uh, CKD population, I'm including dialysis and non-dialysis CKD, the additional cost to healthcare expenditures is, is, quite, is quite substantial. Um, so the, the, these all attest to the fact that, that we need to try and think about what's driving fracture risk in our CKD patients and how we can prevent these fractures from occurring. So we all talk about osteoporosis, and let's talk a little bit about what the overlap is between osteoporosis and CKD. And then we'll go on to define what osteoporosis actually is. So we, we've done work using NHANES data sets to try and determine what the co-prevalence is. And what we found was that when we stratify the US population based on a GFR of 60, that the co-prevalence of osteoporosis in patients with CKD is twofold higher than the prevalence of osteoporosis with healthy kidney function. When you turn that around and you look at patients with a diagnosis of osteoporosis and how many of them have a GFR of less than 35, more than 80% of women age greater than 60 years and more than half of men age greater than 60 years have a GFR of less than 35. That's a really high co-prevalence rate, which means that in our clinics, whether you're an endocrinologist or a nephrologist, you will be seeing patients with these two disorders. So what is osteoporosis? So the WHO ha has operationalized this in the clinic to be a T-score by DEXA of less than minus 2.5. So what is, what's a T-score? So a T-score is a standard deviation, and it compares you to where you would be at your lowest fracture risk. So that's typically a male or, or a woman between 30 and 40 years of age. The NIH, though, has a definition that that's a bit better. So the, the NIH states that the defect, that osteoporosis is a defect in bone strength that results in fracture risk being high. And bone strength is defined by the combination of bone density and bone quality. So bone density, I think we understand, it's based on the T-score, on DEXA imaging, but what is bone quality? And bone quality has to do with the material properties of bone itself. And I think that this is well represented here in these images. Sorry, this is very sensitive. So uh, here you can see a picture of normal bone on your left. You can see that the density is okay, that the structure of the trabeculae are intact, they have both uh, plate-like and rod-like features. Compare that to this piece of bone over here from someone with osteoporosis. You can see that the density is low. You can see that the trabeculae are impaired, they're disconnected, they're perforated. There are holes here in the plates. And all of these result in, in, in decreases in bone strength and are highly correlated uh, with fracture risk. So in CKD patients, we have um, what I like to call a global disorder in bone strength because not only do these patients have defects in bone quantity or their bone density, which can be either cortical or trabecular bone, but they have other defects in their bone quality, which have to do with bone turnover, mineralization, microarchitecture of, of, the, of, the cortical, of the cortical structure. Um, they have defects in repairing microfractures, and they even have defects in the way collagen is laid and in the way that bone mineral is deposited. So as an, as an example of what this actually means, so this group here from Australia used HRPQCT, which I, I just put here an image of to show you what, what, it, what, what, what it can do. It's high-res CT scanning with a resolution down to 60 microns. <clears throat> 
and this is all in vivo. This is someone's uh, wrist, and this is their ankle. And you can see that there are defects here in, in cortical bone. So what this group did here was they took a group of patients, uh, kidney healthy in green, and CKD here in yellow. They imaged them with DEXA and, and with HRPQCT, and they stratified them by whether their DEXA was normal, osteopenic, or osteoporotic. What they showed was that in the patients with CKD, at any level of bone mineral density, there were defects in bone microarchitecture, so in their, in their bone structural quality. They had higher holes in their, in their cortices. They had lower number of trabeculae. The trabeculae were separated uh, so that they were farther apart. And their overall stiffness or, and failure load, so meaning the strength of that bone based on mechanical estimates from the three-dimensional CT imaging, was, it was lower in the CKD patients. We, we've also used HRPQCT to study the effects of CKD on the skeleton. And in contrast to uh, typical postmenopausal osteoporosis, where there is a defect in trabecular bone and trabecular bone loss, we've shown that in CKD patients that, that their progressive defects aren't really in the trabecular compartment, but they're all in the cortical compartment. So they have, over time, loss of cortical area, so, so their cortices, they shrink, their cortical density uh, decreases, and they have an increased number of pores uh, in, the, in the cortex. And the pores uh, greatly impair bone strength because when you, when you load your bone and forces transmitted through the skeleton, if it encounters a hole that can't support that load anymore, then that impairs the strength and increases your fracture risk. Okay, and then we've also used HRPQCT to determine in patients who fracture where, where, where these defects are in the skeleton of the CKD patients. So in, in these data here, what we did was we scanned patients who were kidney healthy, CKD without fractures, and CKD with fractures. Here you have wrist, and here you have tibia. And what we showed was that the defect that correlates the most with fracture is in the cortex, consistent with other data that we've shown and with prior data indicating that, 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 that in, the, in the presence of high PTH levels, that cortical defects are the most common. So then I mentioned the structural aspects that affect bone quality in CKD. But once again, renal osteodystrophy is not just a disorder of bone structure, it's also a disorder of bone turnover and mineralization. And when we're thinking about how, how do we manage CKD patients and their skeleton, we also have to consider this. We have to consider what the turnover is and what the mineralization is. And this greatly affects your choice of treatment. Uh, because the, the different drugs that we have have different effects on turnover and mineralization, and we're going to talk more about how we operationalize that in a moment. So when, so when, I, when I think about CKD, MBD, and renal osteodystrophy and how to manage these patients, I think about these as treating two separate disorders in the same patient. I never think about treating this as a singular entity. And the first thing that I think about is, well, what's the MBD component of this? what's happening with the PTH, the calcium, the phosphorus, and the renal osteo component. What's their bone turnover and what's their mineralization? But even after you treat that, and I think that this is the big part of where we as nephrologists miss and why fracture rates are still increasing in our patients, is that we miss the bone structural component of this. So we're, we're very good at giving vitamin D, we're very good at managing their hyperphosphatemia, but then we think that once that's fixed, everything else is, is fine. However, what, what we've seen is that when you have these big impairments in bone microarchitecture, just treating the patients with PTH suppression alone doesn't fix that problem. And I think that's what we really missed, and that's how we need to operationalize therapies to prevent fractures from occurring. So how then do we reverse these trends, given what we currently have? And here's a bit of a problem. So if we treat our patients, and I'm talking now mostly about on the osteoporosis side, what are the pros of treatment? So we have data in CKD stages one through 3A that indicate effectiveness and safety. We have KD guidelines that recommend treatment in high-risk patients with severe disease. And we know that BMD will increase across the board in our CKD patients when we treat them with these osteoporotic drugs. <clears throat> 
However, there are multiple cons which present multiple problems for us about how to operationalize any, any treatment strategy. We have no fracture outcome data at all in CKD patients 3B through 5D with any of these drugs. We have no clear bone biopsy data for tissue quality effects of these medications. We know that bisphosphonates, which are the most commonly prescribed osteoporotic medication, are retained in the setting of CKD and may oversuppress bone remodeling and damage the skeleton. And then we also need to base treatment on turnover type, and we, and we have a dilemma there. So let's talk then about how we think that we can operationalize what we have given our current state of data and then where we need to go in the future to try and drive this field forward. Back to the cases again. So I give you here now the PTH, FOS, calcium, and D levels. And I want you to focus only on patient number two. Okay, so given that the PTH is 100, FOS is 5, calcium 8.4, and the D level is 35, I want to know what you would do. Where would you start? So how many in the room would start with calcitriol? How about a bisphosphonate? Denosumab? Teriparatide? Romosozumab? Okay, so the, the answer is start with calcitriol. Okay, so let's, let's talk about why that's my selection and why that's where we should start. Okay, so here I give you, I give you the, PT, the, the, the labs and in red is what's abnormal. So here basically you have a patient with CKD osteoporosis and mineral and bone disease with hyperparathyroidism. And you would want to start first with uh, supplementing with uh, vitamin D or, or the analog. Also note that the calcium is a little bit low. So you first want to want to manage the mineral abnormalities, fix, fix the MBD portion of, of this before you move on to giving a drug uh, with, with a powerful skeletal effect. So on the basis of that, let's talk about, about these steps that we've worked with to try and uh, help uh, clinicians uh, manage the mineral and bone disease and osteoporosis and renal failure patients. So the, so, so the first step should be just to manage your CKD MBD. We do that through D-analogs, PTH reduction, phosphate reduction, and maintaining calcium. I think this is probably the easiest part of this, of, of this process. And after we do that, then, it, then we need to assess fracture risk. Now, KDGO does give us some information and some guidelines about what to do. Um, in the 2017 guideline update to KDGO, they said that uh, patients with CKD across the board uh, with evidence of MBD and or, and, and or at risk for fractures and osteoporosis uh, should get BMD testing. So, so who is this? This basically, in my opinion, is, is the majority of our patients. What patient don't we have that is not older, postmenopausal, older male, if they're young, on, on, on high doses of steroids for their GN? So in, in reality, we're being tasked with checking bone density and fracture risk screening for many, many of our patients. What is the data behind that, and what do other associations say uh, besides KDGO about this? So the Europeans, I think, are a little bit more advanced in the clinic about what to do, and the ERA, EDTA, has a separate bone quality working group called EuroROD, and they came out with a statement about two years ago that basically said, that DEXA screening should be completed in the, in the majority of their older patients, and then they give recommendations on which skeletal site and also on other modalities that could be used to assist with fracture risk screening. But I think that this is a very interesting, a very in interesting re recommendation to come out out of another global society, and is something that I, I think that we, sh as an American society, also should consider um, and, and not let the ERA kind of like take this over. Um, Anyway, that's my soapbox. But anyway, so but moving on, what what were the recommendations or the studies that affected uh, KDGO's change in their in their in their statement to recommend this in 2017? So there were three studies that came out. These were prospective, large scale studies. Um, two were in community cohorts. One was in dialysis patients, and they looked at the ability of DEXA to predict fract uh, to predict fractures. They looked at multiple skeletal sites, femoral neck, spine, hip, and they found that DEXA predicted fracture very well in CKD patients. These studies also included kidney-healthy patients, 
and DEXA performed equally well in patients with and without CKD. You could use any skeletal site, spine, hip, or the, or the one-third radius. And the, they also tested the ability of the T-scores from the WHO to predict fracture, and they found that those T-scores worked equally well in patients with and without CKD. So at the time that this came out, this was groundbreaking because prior to 2017, DEXA was not recommended at all in CKD patients. The studies prior to this were small. Uh, they were inconsistent. So th this was really great information for us to have in the clinic so this way we could actually do fracture risk screening. Now, one thing that the osteoporosis world is, in comparison to us, is, is more advanced in terms of screening methods. And DEXA, as good as it is, does have some limitations. For instance, half of all fractures that, that occur in postmenopausal women occur in patients with bone mineral density that's not in the osteoporotic range, so either normal or osteopenic. It's a bone quality issue. DEXA doesn't pick up bone quality, it's just density. So there had been other tools that had been developed, like HRPQCT, but that really is a research tool to help us understand who in that population of patients with osteopenia or normal BMD is at a higher risk for fractures. So one tool is called FRAX. So FRAX is a clinical risk tool that uses your clinical risk factors for fracture that really focus more on your genetics. So family history, age, sex. Um, it includes things like um, did your you know, first degree relative have a fracture in the past? Um, also some medication history. You know, do you use steroids? So this has been very well validated in, in kidney healthy patients and it's also been validated now in patients with CKD. And the best data come from Canada. They took the Manitoba data sets and they stratified the population by GFR 30, 30 to 60, and 60. And they found that that FRAX um, works as well in CKD patients to predict two types of fractures. So FRAX works to, to predict your 10-year absolute risk of a hip fracture, or what we call a major osteoporotic fracture, spine, pelvis, wrist, ankle. So FRAX works great in pre-dialysis CKD and can be used in the setting where you maybe, maybe don't have a DEXA or maybe your DEXA is in the osteopenic range, but for some reason you have concern about your patient. Maybe they're frail. Maybe they have normal BMD, but they're on high-dose steroids. So, so FRAX can be used in that group also. However, the dialysis data is not as robust. Um, there have been two studies, one out of Japan, one out of Poland, and the Polish uh, data sets were, were, were positive and, sh and showed that FRAX was predictive for, for both hip and major osteoporotic fracture. However, from the Japanese data sets, FRAX was not predictive. So I think that in dialysis patients, we need more data uh, before it's, it's used in, instead of DEXA. However, I think that in pre-dialysis CKD, that we can be comfortable with FRAX. An another tool that, that's been developed is, is the trabecular bone score, or TBS. So what, it, what is this? So when you get an image from DEXA, it's an, it's an X-ray. Embedded in that X-ray is a Gaussian distribution of bone mineral. You can take that and you can do some very fancy imaging data processing methods and you, and you can actually pull out of it trabecular bone quality, so trabecular microstructure. Very comparable to trabecular microarchitecture on, on, on cadaver biopsies or cadaver samples and also against HRPQCT. So this has been shown also in postmenopausal women to predict fracture risk in those patients who maybe have a normal DEXA. Okay, it's been very well validated in, in multiple population studies. There have been a few studies in CKD patients, and the data is somewhat mixed. What, what, what the data has shown uh, from large-scale studies, such as, uh, let's say, the data from the Manitoba data sets, was that TBS um, can be predictive um, for, sorry, here we go. TBS can be predictive uh, for uh, major osteoporotic fractures. However, when it comes to hip fractures, uh, TBS didn't seem to predict uh, risk. But then again, the number of fractures here were very low, uh, so it's hard to know whether or not this is a sample size effect. 
so, so basically, overall, what, this, what these data show to us is that we have multiple ways now to screen our patients for fracture risk in the clinic, whether you choose DEXA or you choose FRAX. Um, I wouldn't choose TBS yet, but, but we do have multiple methods to tell us what, what, what risk is. So then step three is, okay, so you have a patient with CKD, MBD, and osteoporosis. You manage their MBD parameter. You've established their risk, and they're at high risk. So now what do you do? So now you need to try and understand what's the best treatment algorithm. And the first step in this is to, to determine what kind of bone turnover do they have. Because e even when you treat the hyperparathyroidism, you may be left with high turnover, low turnover. The drugs that we use to treat these disorders alter bone turnover. And if you get a patient with low bone turnover, an anti-resorptive, you may actually do more damage to their skeleton. However, if they have high bone turnover and you give them an anabolic agent, like teriparatide, which, which is a PTH analog, you may actually cause more damage. So establishing what the turnover type is very important. KDGO tells us that we can use bone biomarkers. So KDGO says to us that PTH and bone alkphos can work, and they can, and they can be used in the clinic, and that we don't need to always go to bone biopsy. Is that true? So, so our, my approach and many other people who work in the field, um, or the, the, the few of us who work in this field, re really use bone biopsy and the bone turnover markers to rule out two disorders. We want to make sure that when we're treating these patients that we want to rule out osteomalacia, because if, if they have a mineralization defect, then you really want to focus on what's driving that. Is it from D deficiency? Is it hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia? Do they have acidosis? Or do they have low turnover bone disease? Because those are the patients where you're going to be apprehensive to give them um, an anti-resorptive agent. So what, what tools can we use in the clinic? So DEXA, unfortunately, does not tell us about turnover type. There have been studies that have compared uh, patients with low, normal, and high uh, bone density uh, with uh, ROD turnover type, and there is no association between your DEXA and your ROD type. So what are the biomarkers? So the, the, these are proteins that are expressed by bone cells. Uh, they come in two flavors bone resorption markers, which are proteins suppressed or excreted by osteoclasts, which are bone, which are cells that break down bone. And uh, some of them are cleared by the kidney. One of them is not. And unfortunately, the one that's not, which is called TRAP, is not available in the clinic. Uh, so in the clinic, we typically use uh, some of these renally cleared biomarkers. So interpreting them can be challenging in the setting of severe CKD. And then the bone formation markers. And these are, are, are proteins that, that are expressed by bone forming cells, so osteoblasts. The two that are not cleared by the kidney, um, bone alkaline phosphatase and, and, and uh, P1NP, um, are available uh, in, in, the, in the clinic. So we can measure those and, and, and use those to assess turnover type. What's the data behind this? So there have been multiple large-scale biopsy studies that have evaluated how these turnover markers work to identify turnover type. And they all show very similar findings and similar diagnostic test characteristics, uh, whether or not we're talking about pre-dialysis CKD, dialysis CKD, or kidney transplant patients. So I'm going to present one article that's the most recent, and I think the nicest because they had 200 patients, and they broke the cohort up into an exploratory cohort and then a validation cohort. And what I just want to show you, because this is a very confusing figure, are, is just two things. So in terms of separating out which patient has high turnover versus non-high and low turnover versus non-low, bone-specific alkaline phosphatase works very well with an AUC above 0.8 for identifying either type of bone disorder. It has a very high negative predictive value for high turnover at about 90% and also for low turnover at 96%. When you combine bone biomarkers, you don't really get much of a bang for your buck in terms of increase, but in terms of positive predictive value, if you combine bone alkphos with, let's say, P1NP, so two clinically available biomarkers, you can then have a positive predictive value for high turnover for 90%. These are pretty good. So this is better than DEXA for fracture risk screening. 
this is better than cholesterol for cardiovascular risk prediction. So, so th these can be really utilized in the clinic to help us understand, and understand what's there. And then, of course, if everything else fails and you have biomarkers that are maybe non-diagnostic or there's maybe something else going on that worries you, like you're worried about osteomalacia or you're worried about low turnover that you really can't pick up with the biomarkers, then bone biopsy if all else fails. I know this sounds like it's very scary, painful, you know, who wants to do this? But to be honest, you know, I've done over 300 of these in the course of my career. Um, I do them in the office using just a combination of Valium and Percocet. Um, it's less scary than a kidney biopsy, less uh, comorbids, um, less bleeding, uh, much te technically very easy to do. And you don't even need to use this big needle here to do the biopsy. You know, we've done work showing that a jam sheety, which, you know, hematology uses to do bone marrow aspirates, can be used to get a bone core, and that this small little bone core has correlations with the bigger one that are quite high. So I, I think in terms of diagnostics, if, if we need to go to a bone biopsy, I don't think that this is really a, a big deal, and, and it, shouldn't, it shouldn't inhibit us from getting the biopsy and then really understanding what's happening to the bone quality. And if we don't want to do it as a nephrologist, maybe we can ask our hematology colleagues, since they do this on a regular basis. So then I'm skipping now to step five, and, that, and then I'll come back to step four in a moment. But this is about treatment now. So you defined risk, you have defined turnover type, and now what do you do? It used to be that KDGO said, you must get a bone biopsy. Now KDGO took away that recommendation before treatment because, not because we had great data, but because of anecdotal evidence that, that these medications seem to be safe to give in our patients. So KDGO said, looks like this is safe, you know, if you can't get a biopsy, it's fine. Give them a bisphosphonate or another drug if, if you think that's, that, that's going to help them. However, let's talk about the problem here. So if we think about the state of randomized clinical trials in nephrology, in, in general, that, that's a problem. But how about for, for, for bone health? Okay, so we only have one clinical trial for Sinecalcet, and that was a negative trial. We have all of these drugs that have had very large-scale clinical trials, enrolled patients based on serum creatinines. Some of those patients had some CKD when you apply a GFR estimation formula to, to the serum creatinine. Typically, these patients had 3A CKD, maybe age-related only, but definitely none of them had CKD MBD, and we've extrapolated that data into CKD patients, even to patients who have severe CKD, but without any clinical trial evidence. And the potential adverse events are substantial. For bisphosphonates, you can have low bone turnover, AKI, CKD progression. For teriparatide and abaloparatide, which are the PTH analogs, you, you can induce hypercalcemia, hyperuricemia, and high bone turnover. For romosozumab, which is the, the new blockbuster drug, you can even induce, uh, maybe induce, in, increased CV risk. So we have no FDA-approved drugs for, for our patients. So everything that we do is off-label. And let's talk a little bit about some more of these problems, because right now the, these drugs do have an FDA indication in CKD stages, one through three A. So let's take a look here at, at this, at this meta-analysis where, where, where they broke down these trials for CKD patients. And, and I've broken this down to spine fractures and all fractures. I want you to focus on the FREEDOM trial. This was the big blockbuster FDA trial for denosumab or Prolia, which got the drug FDA approval. When they applied GFR formulas to the study, a number of patients had some CKD and when, and, when, and when the CKD post hoc analysis came out, it said that Prolia worked for patients with CKD stage 3A. That true. So here's, here's the stratified data. And the study stratified GFR kidney function by Crockroft Galt and MDRD, 
when, when, when you look at the numbers of patients with CKD stages three and four, there's a huge drop off when you go from Cockroft gall to MDRD. Now look down to the fracture event rates for vertebral, non-vertebral fractures stratified by Cockroft gall and MDRD. In the MDRD group, which we accept as a better marker of kidney function, there were no fractures for patients with CKD stage four, and there was no effect for CKD stage three. So they're basing their recommendation on the vertebral fracture event rate based on Cockroft gall. So this is a problem. So we really don't even have that great robust data for patients with CKD stage 3A. But yet we're using these medications in the assumption that because bone mineral density goes up, their fracture rates go down. But we don't have that data to prove that. Now let's talk about the bisphosphonates. These are the most commonly given drugs for osteoporosis. So we don't have any clinical trial data in severe CKD. But what we do have now are several administrative data set studies that have come out of Europe that are beginning to raise, in my opinion, some alarm bells. So we have one positive trial that came out of Denmark showing that with bisphosphonate use, there were significant increases at the spine, total hip, and femoral neck. However, there are three other studies that have come out from Spain, the UK, and Denmark showing that patients with severe CKD who are given these medications have a higher risk of CKD progression in the range of about 14%, and that fracture rates actually go up by about 12%. Now, this is not clinical trial data. It's administrative data set data, which is problematic in its own way. You can't really adjust for confounding very well. So these data may be flawed and maybe even incorrect, but they do raise some concerns. Let me just give you an example here from the data coming out of Spain and the UK. So what they did was they did multiple adjustments for, to try and get rid of, of confounding, and they used a propensity score model from both to do that the best. Um, from the UK data sets and the Spanish data sets, there was a very consistent effect on CKD progression. What they also found was that a few very intriguing interactions. So if you were on these drugs and you had a history of a fracture, your rate of CKD progression was faster than having no history of a prior fracture. If you were a woman, your rate of CKD progression was faster than a man. But what they also found was that there was a lower risk of mortality in the UK data sets. So, there, so a, a few caveats here. So we know from epi data that proteinuria increases fracture risk. But what we don't know for, from, these, from these data is whether or not these patients that had a fracture, maybe their prior history of fracture was correlated with a prior history of having proteinuria, which is a super important predictor for CKD progression. So that's sort of the issue with these data sets and why it's unclear how concerning these data should be to us. So we definitely need these clinical trial data to tell us what these drugs are doing. None of the clinical trials, the thousands of patients enrolled into these bisphosphonate studies, ever showed any effect on, on, on kidney function decline. So, so that's why these data are a little bit interesting and concerning and troubling. However, I don't want to make this sound like we should just ignore the problem. Um, and I want to talk about new directions that, that, that we're going in that hopefully will drive this field forward. So I want to talk about new drugs in osteoporosis. I'm going to talk about novel MBD treatments for bone and then drug repurposing. So let's first start with um, sclerostin. Um, for the non-bone people here, sclerostin is kind of a master regulator of, of skeletal health. It's made by osteocytes. And sclerostin inhibits bone formation and enhances bone resorption. When we get older, sclerostin levels naturally rise. Um, if we load the skeleton with exercise, sclerostin levels go down. Okay, so there's a, a, a drug called Romosozumab, Evanity, which is an antibody against sclerostin. It's a big blockbuster drug. It's on the market. Works very well for osteoporosis and fracture risk prediction, protection. And secondary analyses of 
the major clinical trials showed that in patients with lower GFR, that they had equivalent increases in bone density at the spine, hip, femoral neck, um, in comparison to patients with good kidney function. And then in terms of the fracture data, um, they showed that patients with CKD, or with lower GFRs, had equivalent uh, decreases in fracture risk compared to kidney-healthy patients. However, the big problem with romosozumab is that there was one study that showed that there was maybe an increase in cardiovascular risk with romosozumab. So sclerostin is also made in, in vascular foci of calcification. Renal failure patients, as we know, are at increased risk of vascular calcification, and maybe that sclerostin is being produced in that foci to protect them from progressive vascular calcification. So it's unclear, you know, whether or not this drug could be safe in CKD patients, and it's also unclear whether or not in the general population whether it actually increases risk. There was an issue with that one trial. So in, in the original trial that was placebo-controlled, there was no increase in cardiovascular risk with ROMO. However, in the trial that showed increased risk, the patients were not placebo-controlled. They were, they were either on a, they were on a long course of alendronate, which, which, which is somewhat cardioprotective, and then they were either continued on alendronate versus put on romosozumab. That increased risk in that population may just be unmasking a protective effect of alendronate. So, but anyway, so in renal failure patients, now we have one study out of Japan that showed some interesting bone effects. So these were about 100 dialysis patients, placebo-controlled, they had low cardiovascular risk to begin with. So the main cause of ESRD was IgA in this cohort. About 15% of the cohort had hypertension or diabetes. And they were screened specifically to be at low cardiovascular risk. So what did they, what did they show? So they showed that in the ROMO group, that there were significant increases in bone density at both the spine and the femoral neck. And that in the, in the placebo group, there was either no change or a slight non-significant decrease in bone density at those same sites. When they looked at the bone turnover markers, so when they looked at the calcium and the PTH, there was a slight drop in calcium with ROMO administration and an increase in PTH, which was expected given, given its physiology, but those two parameters normalized over time. And then when they looked at bone-specific alkaline FOS and P1NP, which are bone formation markers, there was an increase with ROMO. And the CTX, or the TRAP levels, which is the resorption marker, didn't change. So we call this an anabolic window. So what happened is that the, the bone physiologic effect to ROMO was exactly what we would expect in a kidney-healthy population. So very, very promising in terms of this agent potentially being used in a certain portion of renal failure patients at lower cardiovascular risk. When they did their event rates in this trial, there was no increased event rates in the treatment group. So it was, I thought it was very promising. It could potentially be useful in our patients. The next thing that I want to talk about in terms of new drugs for CKD patients, etalcalcetide. So this is an intravenous calcimimetic, very powerful, has a 72-hour half-life, administered IV on dialysis, much better in terms of PTH suppression than sinicalcet. So we conducted a, a nine-month pilot trial, which unfortunately got cut short because of the pandemic. But the effect of etalcalcetide was so powerful that even with our smaller sample size, we were still able to detect significant effects on the skeleton. So, so I, I'm going to give you these data in terms of z-scores and percent changes. And then the table is just for you to conceptualize what these percent changes mean for fracture risk reduction. So what we found was that there was about a 0.5 z-score change in increase in bone density over nine months. So that's a half a standard deviation z-score with only nine months of treatment at, at, at the femoral neck. There was about a 0.3 z-score change at the, at the spine and maybe about a 0.1 z-score change at the hip, all significant. That translated into a 6.6% increase in bone density at the hip 
we know from the data in the, in, the, in the kidney healthy population that when you, sorry, that these changes in bone density in the range of about 7%, so if you start with a very low T-score and you increase your bone density by about 7.5%, that's a 23% reduction in your fracture risk. So if we, and, and that's an annualized percent change. So we saw 6%, 6.5% 6 over nine months, so you figure that's maybe over a year, maybe nine, 10%. So, so this drug could potentially have powerful effects on fracture risk reduction for our dialysis patients. Now, how about drugs that are currently used in CKD patients that could potentially be used for fracture risk reduction and, 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 and osteoporosis? There's a whole literature about potassium citrate in kidney healthy patients. This literature was based on the fact that Western diets are high in acid, and the bone is the biggest buffer of acid in the body. So when we eat a high acid diet, we leach calcium out of the bone to mobilize the, 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 the alkali. If you give sodium alkali, you induce hypercalciuria. That's also bad for your skeleton. So the data on potassium citrate is, is, it was in postmenopausal women and older men. It resulted over a 24-month period in about 3 to 4% increases in bone density. And it resulted in suppression of bone resorption and increases in bone formation. So not only does it seem that potassium citrate has a protective effect due to, acid, due to alkali loading, but also maybe has an anabolic effect. So we currently have an R01 pilot trial that, that's funded, a multicenter study between Einstein, uh, Columbia, and Pitt, where we're um, looking at the effect of six months of potassium alkali treatment from kids to adults, because kids get CKD2 and they get horrible bone disease. And we're, we're enrolling patients starting now, age five and older, um, into, into the six-month pilot trial. And our primary outcome is HRPQCT-based um, measures of the radius and tibia. So hopefully in about three years, we'll have some great data that can then go into a larger U01. Another, another um, very interesting thing about bone is that it is regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. And the SNS results in increases in bone resorption and suppresses bone formation. There's a very large literature on this and the use of beta blockers to protect the skeleton. Currently, Elizabeth Shane at Columbia and Sandeep Kosla at the Mayo have an incredible R01 uh, where they're looking at atenolol as a bone protective agent. And some of these patients will have moderate CKD. So I, I hope that you know, when this data becomes available, that maybe we can have a way forward to study this specifically in our patients with late stage CKD. And then finally, I think to really push this field forward, we need to copy what's been done in the osteoporosis world, where they looked at bone biology and transcript omics to identify new agents that, that could be used to really, really preserve the skeleton. And currently, in conjunction with, with Val, um, Hartmut, Maluki, and Isidro at, at UCLA, uh, we have a new grant that, that was funded to really look at transcript omics in the bone space and then to make this data widely available to anybody who wants it. Um, this study is just getting started. Val has received the first biopsies, and our, our goal is that over a two-year period, we'll have 15 or 16 biopsies done, 12 in CKD patients, four in kidney-healthy people, and that this can potentially lead into the, to a much larger study that can truly change the paradigm of, of renal osteodystrophy. So I want to just close and, and present you with something about treating osteoporosis and CKD. And this was, a, this was an algorithm that we developed in conjunction with one of my mentees about how we can try at least use what we currently have to help. And the first step, of course, is treating the MBD, lifestyle interventions, good diet, sunlight, vitamin D, manage the MBD, DEXA scanning for fracture risk screening. If patients have high risk for fracture, such as osteoporosis or prior fracture history, assess their bone turnover, and then based on that, treat them with either an anabolic agent or an anti-resorptive, and then monitor them with DEXA scanning every one to two years, as we would do for the general population. Step four comes in, which I skipped before now, where because of the 
question ab about whether or not these agents that we're using may be nephrotoxic, that treatment should be coordinated between endocrinology and nephrology, that we should baseline risk assess them for CKD progression and then monitor them over time, and then if something looks concerning, stop the drug and then, and then continue to monitor. So I want to thank you for having me. I want to summarize and conclude uh, that CKD-induced osteoporosis is due to global impairments in bone quality and strength. Remember that fracture rates and the clinical outcomes are worse in CKD patients, that we should be thinking about this in our clinic. We have tools to risk classify patients. We should use them. We have some drugs right now that might be useful, but we definitely need better data, and we need our own drugs for specifically CKD patients. So I want to thank all of my collaborators and, and my funding, and I'm open for any questions. You are right, and the answer is no. So, so, there, so there's nothing right now being developed as a specifically renal osteodistrophy panel. That would be a great idea, um, and using the ones that are not cleared by the kidney. Um, one thing that we're doing, so Sharon Mo and I have an R01 now where we're looking at microRNA profiling of the skeleton to, to look at bone turnover types. We have some great data uh, on four microRNAs that we published on that correspond to osteoblast and osteoclast uh, development and function. Um, we're now, we have an R01 to do microRNA seq to see if there's others that we should be considering, and then also manipulating the skeleton to see how the biomarkers change with treatment. So, giving patients teriparatide, giving them anti resorptives, and seeing how they, uh, how they change with turnover type changes. And then we're also doing functional assays of the osteoblast. So, we're taking the microRNAs, we're going to take them down, and then see how that affects osteoblast development and, and, and function. So, our, our goal with, with that project is to come to a point where we can develop some sort of a panel where we combine maybe the microRNAs, maybe with a protein biomarker also. So, currently, no, but hopefully, uh, down the pipeline, that would be happening. You mean in terms of the biomarkers, or you, or you mean it? So, 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 so the data that I presented on the biomarkers was actually had a nice cohort in that where, like, of the 200 patients, half were transplanted, and they were on, on uh, immunosuppressants like, like, like steroids. And there was no difference in how the biomarkers performed between patients post-transplant versus regular CKD. So the, and the, the biomarker studies in transplant patients tend to show that also, that, that, that the AUCs typically are in the same range. The issues with the biomarkers are also in the sense that it's kind of like the PTH story. There are multiple assays. They're not standardized. Everybody has their, every lab has their own. So you're dealing with different reference ranges. So that, that's, that's another problem that, that we have. But they, but, but they work equally well. I mean the, uh, the, the the biopsies. I don't, so I, um, I, I I I'm mixed on this, and I don't I don't think that every every renal failure patient needs a bone biopsy. I think that really, if it's if you have a a patient that's at high risk for fracture and 
you, you check the bone turnover markers and you can't quite figure out what's going on. In, in many cases, the biomarkers aren't clear cut. Like they're, they're in the middle and you don't know, you know, and you, you, you may have high concern for osteomalacia. Like let's say you have a very complex patient, you know, who was dialysis and then transplant them back to dialysis on multiple medications. Um, and their, their vitamin D is off and their calcium is off. Like those are the patients who you're like, hmm, you know, this patient's really complex. Maybe there's osteomalacia and maybe that patient needs a biopsy. But for the most part, I don't, I don't think that we need to do biopsies in everybody. I think it's a skill though that we should maintain just like, but there's controversy even behind kidney biopsies now. So I don't want to in, inject that into the conversation. And I think that outsourcing this to like a hematologist who does this on a regular basis and could probably, you know, just get a jam sheety core and it's probably fine. Uh, my, my, my thoughts on, on, the, on the increased fracture, on the potential increase in fracture risk with SGL2s? Is that the question? I, I, I mean, it's, it's mixed. I, they, there was a subsequent study that came out that didn't really show an effect. I don't know if the endocrine people here have, have a thought on this, but I kinda, it kind of fell off my radar after like, inconsistent data was coming out. And I, I don't think of it really as causing an increase in fracture risk, but I don't know if the endocrine people have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess you know, do, do you stop it? I, I mean, that's the big question: should you stop it? And no, and no one, and no one knows. Um, however, I, you know, cu coming off of DMAB, I, I do, you know, I, I, I give them a bisphosphonate. So even if they're on dialysis, coming off DMAB, I will give them a bisphosphonate because you really have no choice. Um, what's my choice of bisphosphonate? So given the fact that they are cleared by the kidney and they hang around for a long time, I typically start with Fosamax. I do, I do regular Fosamax dosing, despite the severe CKD, because I think that the risk of bone loss and vertebral fractures is higher, in my opinion, than any potential negative effect of the bisphosphonate. And I monitor their CTX, and if I don't see, you know, like a doubling in the CTX level, then I continue them on Fosamax. However, if I see that the CTX really jumps up, I, I change them over to IV uh, reclast. Very, it's very similar to what, what you do in your kidney healthy patients. There really, there, there really is no choice. I mean, you, you, you have to do something. But I, my feeling is that I, I would rather do five years of prolia with maybe one year of bisphosphonate rather than do a prolonged course of the bisphosphonate get, given this risk benefit profile that right now is very unclear. Thank you.